right, so we're going to start this afternoon um, with some talk on knees. And our first presenter, I'm happy to introduce to you, Dr. Drew Lansdowne. Um, I do get to work, work with Drew up in Marin a little bit, um, where he has part of his practice, and he's here at Mission Bay the other times. Um, Drew specializes in uh, knee and shoulder sports medicine. He did a sports me medicine and surgery fellowship at Rush um, University Medical Center in Chicago. Prior to that, he did do his residency here at UCSF in um, orthopedics, and he did medical school at University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine, and his undergrad was in biomedical engineering at Vanderbilt. Um, so he's going to talk to us today about common knee problems and um, what to do about them, how to diagnose them, and then at, following him, I will introduce the next um, speaker who will show us how to do exams on the knee. So thank you very much, Drew, and we look forward to your talk. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll get my um, slides pulled up here. Um, and um, thank you all for joining today. Um, definitely wish that we could be doing this, um, you know, in person. Always think that that's a little more fun, but um, hopefully this will still be helpful and useful. Um, and so we'll be talking about diagnosing and managing top knee problems in primary care. Um, I believe the slides should be available. Um, if there are any issues with that, I'm happy to get copies. Um, and then happy to you know take questions when we're done and um, discuss anything uh, both during this and also offline later if needed. Um, so uh, disclosures are listed here, um, some research funding and um, other work and uh, none should be relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, for this talk, um, kind of my objectives that I've laid out. So uh, first discuss um, some of the common problems that you know you may encounter in that primary care setting um, and base those around some cases like how these patients will present and um, what to be thinking about. Um, and then we'll go through some of the key points in history and physical exam um, and the best way to you know, reach the correct diagnosis. Um, and then I've tried to add in um, some of the more common questions that I'll get from patients in those um, situations and then um, like how to discuss those um, next steps and um, how to counsel people through um, some of the decision making that we'll do. All right, so to begin, um, I think it's always important to highlight um, anatomy. Um, so any issue with the knee, um, so much of it just comes down to you know what structure is involved, um, and that will really dictate our ultimate treatment plan. Um, and so um, would imagine a lot of people haven't looked at knee anatomy um, recently, which is fine, but um, always worth refreshing. And then um, I'll like to think of, you know, our potential differential diagnosis um, in reference to those anatomical structures. Um, and, you know, there are only so many parts of the knee that will, you know, end up causing problems for the majority of cases. And so it's really, um, you know, is it an issue with the cartilage, an issue with the meniscus, the ACL, the collaterals, um, the extensor mechanism? Um, you could certainly throw in the IT band, the hamstrings. Um, those, um, you know, soft tissue structures around the knee. Uh, but a lot of what we'll be dealing with, um, it will come down to these and then, um, you know, referencing back to that knee anatomy and figuring out what we need to do to solve the problem. All right, so we'll start with a case. Um, so to begin, this is a 62-year-old man. Um, he's complained of eight months of worsening achy right knee pain. Um, he said, you know, he injured the knee in high school, played football, um, uh, able to lead an active life. Um, nothing that he recalls more recently that seemed to trigger this. Um, he used to enjoy running, but has had to stop because of the pain, uh, complains of medial pain, and then uh, sometimes has some knee swelling. Um, on exam, he has that mild swelling, um, can pick up a, a mild effusion. Um, his range of motion is a little restricted, um, lacks about 15 degrees of flexion, and then he's tender at the medial joint line. Um, so with that limited info, um, would love to pull the audience and um, what would you say is the most likely diagnosis? Does he have osteoarthritis, uh, medial meniscus tear, an ACL injury, patellofemoral pain, um, or um, IT band syndrome?
All right, great. So um, the results are on, on the screen there. So 61% of you um, picked osteoarthritis. I'd agree with that. 32% that medial meniscus tear could certainly be that too. There's so much overlap and we'll talk through that as we go. Uh, but I would agree that OA is probably our leading diagnosis. Medial meniscus tear is a close second. Uh, perfect. So um, knee arthritis is incredibly common. Um, one in 10 adults suffers from arthritis. Uh, with the knee being the most commonly affected joint. Um, and arthritis is impactful with regards to um, the activities that people are able to participate in, um, their overall health and perception of general health. Um, and then has huge impact on um, expenditures in healthcare um, and is really an impactful condition that um, you know, we will encounter on a very frequent basis. Uh, these patients, so they will present with pain and stiffness um, and then um, decreased activity. So this is often, um, I've had to give up X, Y, Z, because when I try to do that, my knee flares up. I know it's not gonna be happy. It's gonna stick with me for a while. Um, may be accompanied by weight gain, um, just usually related to that decreased activity. Um, and then mental health is often impacted by musculoskeletal conditions. Um, and people can have um, exacerbation of um, depression, other mental health symptoms. Um, due to um, these uh, musculoskeletal limitations. Uh, the exam, so, you know, the arthritis will vary in its degree of severity. Um, and um, the exam will also be highly variable, but you may notice uh, some deformity on the affected knee. Um, you may be able to pick up an effusion, um, especially if the knee is more flared up at the time of evaluation. Um, and then they'll often have some restriction in range of motion. It can be just a bit, but um, sometimes it's even more severe where they're not able to flex past 90 degrees because um, that uh, joint is so affected. Uh, sometimes you can feel osteophytes um, that, um, you know, just along the periphery of the joint. And then when the patient ranges their knee, can often feel crepitus. Um, and then probably the best marker is just uh, tenderness along the joint line. Um, and then with the hands-on sessions tomorrow, um, you know, should be able to practice and get tips on, you know, detecting an effusion and then also palpating the joint line, which I think are, you know, key points of the exam. Um, this is a patient um, at the time of a knee arthroscopy, just demonstrating what arthritis looks like. Um, and, you know, going back to our anatomy, so um, the, this is the femoral condyle here, and this should be covered by that smooth articular cartilage. And then here we just see exposed bone. Um, this is the tibial plateau where this is more normal cartilage through here. Um, and then this is just completely um, ebernated bone as well. Um, and then this is the meniscus, which is um, um, not normal um, at this point. So um, that's kind of what that um, anatomic visualization of that structure looks like. Um, when we are diagnosing arthritis, uh, still the best treatment or the best um, tool to diagnose will be um, radiographs. Um, and uh, we are looking for multiple signs on the x-rays to indicate arthritis. Um, those include joint space narrowing, uh, formation of osteophytes, um, subchondral cysts, and sclerosis, like thickening of the bone. <laughs> um, and there are multiple ways to grade arthritis. The kelgren lawrence scale is the most common, but um, in general, something like mild, where you know this patient has maybe a little narrowing of the joint space, but overall maintained joint. Here, this medial joint line here, certainly more narrowed. Um, and then here where that joint space is just um, obliterated and that, that patient's completely bone on bone. Um, interestingly, um, symptom severity doesn't always correlate to that radiographic appearance. So there are times when this patient um, is actually more symptomatic than um, somebody with an image like this. Um, so it's really listening to their complaints, understanding their exam, um, and how that factors into their life over just that radiographic appearance. Um, this is a patient who um, was um, who I saw for um, lateral sided joint pain, had these x-rays. And um, one really important point is um, these x-rays are non-weight bearing. Um, if you are evaluating anyone with a knee injury, concern for arthritis, more chronic condition, um, would always encourage you to get weight-bearing x-rays. Um, and it, that weight-bearing lets us see how the joint responds to load. Um, so this patient, for instance, so this is a non-weight-bearing x-ray of their knee. Um, you can see osteophytes 
at the margin of the lateral compartment. Um, but really this, this doesn't look that bad. Um, and then you have that patient stand and then they are completely um, just bone on bone. Um, and so that um, um, X-ray under load is incredibly important um, for decision-making um, and really gives us a sense for how that knee is responding when that patient is standing. Um, so um, if the patient is able to stand, um, would always get weight-bearing x-rays as the default option. Um, oftentimes, um, we'll have patients um, who, you know, they will have arthritis, um, some degree on x-ray, um, and then hope still to have an MRI of the knee. Um, you know, we know that MRI gives better soft tissue resolution, kind of gives, um, you know, more detailed information about the joint. Um, and sometimes I think people feel like they're not being fully evaluated with that, without that more thorough, um, imaging study. Um, and what I'll counsel patients is so first, um, x-rays will give us a better understanding. Um, so it gives us that more global picture of how the joint is responding to load. Um, and so it would always start with x-rays. Um, and sometimes people will say, well, it feels more like a soft tissue problem. It doesn't feel bony, but um, you know, that, um, how that joint reacts to load is what we'll really be able to see on x-ray. So, um, it is important to have, and then, um, that will always be our first line, um, imaging study to look at the knee. Um, another point that's really important is insurance is unlikely to cover the MRI without plain radiographs done first. Um, so if somebody is hesitant, then it's like, you know, this will be able to screen, we'll be able to check, um, see what that joint looks like, um, give a lot of good information. And then we probably can't even get that other study um, um, approved without getting this information first. Um, and then sometimes people come, they already have had an MRI um, and I will still look to get x-rays um, because that information is complementary. Um, you know, the MRI, you're supine, you're laying down, non-weight bearing. Um, it gives you, uh, you know, great imaging of the cartilage, meniscus, ligaments, but um, doesn't always tell you the whole story of just how that uh, knee is responding to load. So um, would still push for these, um, even with hesitation. Um, and then, so when we're looking at treatment options, um, so knee arthritis can be incredibly hard to successfully treat. Um, and people will talk a lot about like this treatment gap where, um, you know, you go from a normal knee and then we know with end stage arthritis, that final treatment option is a knee replacement. Um, that can work. It's an effective treatment. Uh, but for that patient with more mild to moderate knee arthritis, knee replacement may not be the right option, but then also, you know, just observation isn't sufficient either. So the treatment options that have been shown um, to reliably work, so medications and just sticking with NSAIDs and acetaminophen, um, I would not recommend um, like opioid medication, um, but um, um, I think the, probably the best efficacy and safety profile with um, NSAIDs and um, acetaminophen. Um, injections can be very helpful. Um, usually as a first line, we'll start with a cortisone injection, just standard steroid injection. Um, there are reports and prior studies where um, you can have cartilage thinning um, with repeated steroid use. Um, like there's no question that um, it can cause um, some damage to the articular cartilage. Um, so it's certainly not good for use in a completely normal joint. Um, and then I do think judicious usage for that symptomatic management um, still has a role. Um, and then if patients have a more limited response to cortisone injection, um, and of our other injection options are hyaluronic acid, platelet-rich plasma. We'll talk a little bit about that in the coming slides. Um, and then physical and therapy, exercise and weight loss. Um, these are do have good evidence to support their use in um, improving symptoms. Um, so if patients haven't tried, this would always um, encourage this. Um, the knee, you know, it sees like seven to 10 times body weight, especially at the patellofemoral joint. And so any weight that the patient's able to lose um, will take less, um, put less stress on the knee um, and um, will help with symptoms in most cases. Um, and then an unloader brace, um, if somebody has unicompartmental arthritis with deformity at the knee, um, so if that's just isolated to the medial compartment or to the lateral compartment, that unloader brace can kind of actively push their weight towards the other compartment where the knee joint is healthier. 
Um, and for some patients that can be a good option. Um, they are often bulky, they are expensive. And as I think due to that bulkiness, the adherence can often be low. Um, I'll recommend that people like take a look at the brace, um, see if an orthotist can show them what that brace looks like. Um, and if they say, there's no way I'm going to ever wear that thing, then I would um, just listen to that instinct and not get it due to the cost. Um, but then if, you know, if they're open to it and they have that specific arthritic pattern, um, it can be a good tool, um, especially to use with activity to stay active um, while putting less stress through that um, affected part of the joint. All right. And so it's not uncommon that um, we'll have a patient with mild to moderate arthritis. And uh, what I'll hear is I don't want a knee replacement, but I do want to be better. And, um, you know, that I've tried NSAIDs, I've tried Tylenol, I've had an injection and I, I still hurt. I'm limited, but I'm not having a knee replacement. And, um, you know, the I don't think the best answer is always just, well, you know, wait until you can't have a knee replacement and, uh, or wait for it to get worse. Um, so some of these other treatments are what we'll try in that um, treatment gap. Um, so we'll talk a bit on the next couple of slides, but probably the best options for the active patient for moderate arthritis, um, one would be a platelet rich plasma injection, and then can always consider an osteotomy for realignment. Um, and then the options without evidence to support their use. So an arthroscopic debridement to just clean up the knee, um, and stem cell injections. Um, we're still not there yet um, and would um, try to counsel your patients against spending large amounts of money on um, something that probably is not going to uh, move the needle for them. Um, so when people ask about um, like just cleaning up the knee, so this is something that used to be done routinely um, and um, there have been a number of um, uh, well-done randomized trials on the topic. Um, so this study um, out of the New England Journal of Medicine uh, from quite a while ago, but um, still I think has really changed like the way that we practice. Um, so they compared arthroscopic surgery um, in knee arthritis uh, to control like working with physical therapy. Um, and you almost don't even need to know which group's red, which group is blue, uh, because they just track along the exact same thing. So red is the arthroscopic surgery, uh, blue is control, and this is looking at their Womax scores at various points from um, zero to 24 months after surgery and can see that it just really doesn't change anything. So, um, you know, a knee scope just to clean up arthritis would not recommend. Um, and the main principle that I'll tell people is like, we can't like reverse those changes. Um, it's only, you know, just kind of removing what's loose and it just probably isn't worth the risk of going through um, the surgical treatment. Uh, for stem cells, um, there's no evidence at this point that they can reverse arthritis. Um, this is uh, an image just from a um, website on the internet um, showing, you know, before and after, and then, you know, now we've got a nice joint space, but um, I would um, say that there's not um, evidence that this actually happens. Um, and, you know, there are a number of studies on um, maybe potential options in the future, um, if there are research studies, would encourage people to participate in those. But um, um, these treatments will often be five, ten, twenty thousand um, dollars, and just uh, probably do not have the predictable response to justify um, that type of cost. Um, and then, you know, we have a lot of interest about like platelet-rich plasma. So does PRP work? Um, I do think it can be an option in mild to moderate knee arthritis. Um, I will tell patients it will not reverse degenerative changes. So the goal of this is not to regrow cartilage, regrow meniscus. Um, it likely will not prevent an eventual knee replacement either. Um, it is expensive, about $1,000 um, out of pocket for an, each injection, um, but it can help with symptomatic management. <laughs> um, this study was a randomized study on platelet-rich plasma Sorry, versus... hyaluronic acid for um, mild to moderate knee arthritis. And what they found was um, these groups tracked pretty similarly um, where their outcome scores improved. Um, and then they did find that the um, inflammatory response in the knee was better with PRP, so some biologic modulation. Um, and then the um, IKDC score stayed higher in the PRP group. So um, kind of interpreted that this um, PRP may let people stay a bit more active, um, do a bit more with their knees and seem to offer more benefit to hyaluronic acid. 
Um, HA can often be covered by insurance, so it can still be worth trying uh, depending on um, the financial situation. Um, but PRP, I think it can be used in that mild to moderate arthritis looking for symptomatic relief. Um, another interesting approach is an osteotomy. Um, so this is looking uh, or an option for patients with um, you know, arthritic changes isolated to one compartment. So either the medial compartment or the lateral compartment. Um, this patient, for instance, he's 31, um, has medial left knee pain. Um, has had previous meniscus surgery, has a large cartilage defect. Um, and he's having trouble walking, daily activities, um, played soccer at a high level, but um, you know, his life is quite limited. So he's young, he's active, unicompartmental arthritis, this outside part's totally normal. The hard part is um, the osteotomy is a longer rehab course and then can still have some residual symptoms. We're not reversing the arthritis, we're not getting rid of it, just offloading it. Um, this is what he looks like when he's standing. It's his left knee that's most affected. Um, and um, if you look at where his weight goes, this red line, um, it's all the way on that inside part of his knee, um, almost medial to the knee, but his weight's going to be concentrated in that area that's worn out. <laughs> um, with the osteotomy, we can essentially um, put a cut in his tibia, and realign him, and then now his weight's going more through the outside part. And with that, now he can bear weight, he can preserve his knee. Um, he'll need a knee replacement almost certainly someday, but hopefully that's when he's 50, 60, much older. Um, and then get some good activity out of the knee in between. All right. So next case, hopefully this will go away. 55-year-old um, woman, um, right knee pain for a month that started after a long walk. No pop, no injury that she remembers. Maybe had some swelling the next day. Um, she's continued with her activities, but that pain is just not changing. Um, on exam, mild effusion, tender at the medial joint line, pain with McMurray's. All right, I'll pause for a second as we take our poll. All right. So, um, perfect. So 67% medial meniscus tear. Um, I would agree based on that limited description. Um, and then second between patellofemoral syndrome OA, but, um, yeah, I think the medial meniscus tear is a likely culprit in that case. So, um, for meniscus tears, um, these can present in a variety of different ways, but we'll usually see knee pain, um, for a degenerative tear, it's usually low-level activity-related swelling. Um, and then you can have the clicking, popping, catching feeling. Um, and then patients will often describe pain and deep flexion, as well as pain with um, twisting and pivoting on the knee. Um, on physical exam findings, and encourage you to practice these tomorrow, um, we'll often see joint line tenderness, um, pain with McMurray's, Apley's, Thessaly, deep squat, and duck walk. Um, my way of thinking about the physical exam for the meniscus, um, basically all of the tests, um, they're quick and easy to do, and I'll do all of them, um, and then use you know that combination. If most are positive, leaning more towards meniscus. If it's just one, um, may not be because the sensitivity and specificity on all of them is kind of limited. Uh, for treating degenerative meniscus tears, so this is another impactful study. There's others like this, uh, but basically sham surgery versus arthroscopic surgery, again, have the same response. So surgery is probably not our best first line treatment. Um, would recommend starting with PT, oral anti-inflammatories, and possibly a cortisone injection. Um, and then arthroscopy can help for those who failed non-surgical treatment, uh, but not that best initial treatment. 
Um, when patients are asking again about an MRI, um, especially from the start, if it's been one month of pain, um, even if it is that medial meniscus tear, would still start with PT. So I'll usually tell them that that MRI, it won't change our management initially. Most people will improve with the non-operative treatment. It's just time, cost, um, and it's probably not needed. Um, I would try the formal PT program, could even try an injection if the knee's inflamed. Um, insurance often won't cover that MRI without a trial of non-operative treatment for a degenerative meniscus tear. Um, so would try to hold off on that, but um, you know, if they're not responding, it's certainly, that's a good step to take. Um, there are, on the other hand, some meniscus tears that um, we orthopedic surgeons should see and treat more urgently. Um, and then um, two specific tear types, so a bucket handle tear, um, where we'll see loss of motion, especially in knee extension, and a root tear where we get large effusion, lots of pain. Um, this exam can be hard because it may only be some joint line tenderness. Um, so this one you just have to have in the back of your head. Uh, we'll talk about it as we go. Um, and then if it's a younger patient, acute twisting injury, um, those may be treated best with uh, meniscus repair. So probably worth seeing earlier rather than after um, you know months of PT. Um, a bucket handle meniscus tear. So this happens after an acute twisting injury. Um, we'll see restricted motion. Um, and then what happens is that meniscus flips into the front of the knee and can lose extension. Um, whenever that knee is stuck after an injury, um, that should have like an urgent MRI referral to surgeon. And ideally we're seeing them one to two days after injury. Um, initially I would ask the patient to be on crutches. If their knee is really locked and stuck, tell them not to force range of motion until that MRI is done. And you can say, you know, is there something sitting there? Because if they're pushing against it, they may damage the meniscus more. And that's just after repair. Uh, for root tears, um, hopefully you've heard about these at uh, this conference before, uh, but that's like detachment of that posterior attachment. And it completely disrupts meniscus function. With these, you can more rapidly progress to advanced arthritis, even in the course of a year or two. Um, at 10 years, uh, rates of arthritis are over 95% if you leave these alone. Um, so we can change the natural history of that degenerative progression by repairing the meniscus. Um, and this is what it looks like surgically, where we put stitches in, we pull it back down and securely tighten it to bone. <coughs> All right. So on to our next case. Um, this is a 23-year-old woman, injured her knee playing soccer, planted to kick the ball, twisted her knee, felt a pop, pain, couldn't keep playing. Swelling that started one to two hours after. On exam, a large effusion and a 2B Lachman. What is our diagnosis? Let's see. Um, we'll just skip ahead on the poll, but um, ACL injury. So um, the ACL will be our most common surgically treated knee ligament. Um, oftentimes it's that non-contact twisting injury. Um, most patients will either feel or hear a pop <coughs> and then they'll have swelling shortly after the injury. Most of the time they don't go back to play. Uh, they kind of know that something's wrong with the knee and they can't go back in. Um, in contrast to a meniscus where you may tweak the knee, no pop, or may have a small pop, uh, and then may be able to keep playing afterwards. On exam, the knee will be swollen, have restricted range of motion, um, and then this positive Lachman, so where we're translating the tibia forward, and then the pivot shift test will be positive. Um, for initial management, so that diagnosis is really made on the physical exam and with the history, and then we'll get an MRI to evaluate the meniscus, the cartilage, and look for associated injuries. So anytime you have a patient who has that large traumatic effusion, um, the root cause is going to be a hemarthrosis. That's how the knee can blow up very quickly is it just bleeds into that space. <clears throat> the ACL is one condition that can cause that. Uh, there's a blood vessel in the ACL that can tear and then just bleed into the knee. The other causes to think about if you're seeing a patient with that presentation, a patellar tendon rupture, quadriceps tendon rupture, patellar dislocation or a fracture um, or osteochondral injury. Um, and so when sometimes that Lachman can be hard, um, his knee's swollen, the patient's painful, 
um, and they may not relax and it can be hard to just get that feel. Um, what I would encourage you to do is always check for the extensor mechanism. So make sure they can do a straight leg raise that you're not looking at a rupture of that structure. Check the patellar mobility. Like, was it that the patella dislocated? Um, and then on x-ray, we can often tell, you know, if there's a fracture, if they're not bearing weight, things like that. Um, hopefully, you know, can diagnose it on physical exam. Um, if you have a young patient with an effusion, um, I would say there always needs to be more workup to get a definitive answer. You know, it can be, you know, some um, odd presentation, some inflammatory condition, um, but uh, these are ones where, you know, pushing for imaging, pushing for the diagnosis is probably the best approach. So patients will often ask with an ACL tear, do they have to have surgery? Um, so a lot of patients can be managed non-operatively. Um, the goals of surgery um, are to restore stability to the knee um, and then decrease rates of subsequent meniscus and cartilage injuries and more predictably get them back to higher level cutting and pivoting activities. Um, initially after injury, um, we'll have them rest, ice, anti-inflammatories, work on range of motion exercises, try to keep the quad going. Um, get on crutches and refer them immediately if there's a block to motion. Sometimes you can have an ACL plus set bucket handle tear. Um, and then for those patients who are looking to get back to um, more cutting pivoting activities, uh, this is what we'll do where um, we'll take a tendon, uh, place those holes in the bone, and then um, pull that up to reconstruct the ACL and then um, get them back to their activities after a rehab course. Uh, a lot of patients are interested in uh, kind of innovation in this area. Um, two things that are often brought up, just to give you some um, thought on this. Um, so there's a lot of interest right now in ACL repair. Um, so historically, we've reconstructed the ligament, taken a tendon and replaced it. Um, and then there's a newer implant um, that you know may be able to let us repair it. Um, it's still surgery, um, but um, it involves putting in a scaffold and repairing the ACL. Um, so far, the studies have shown that it's not inferior to our traditional treatment. Um, the re-tear rate is a bit higher. Um, I would say it's still a bit early. There's a number of um, high-quality studies that are ongoing that will hopefully answer, you know, where um, this is. But if patients ask you about, you know, repair versus reconstruction, this is probably what they've been, um, you know, what they've been reading. Um, and, um, you know, it's still in investigation, um, but um, something that may be coming more in the future. Um, there's also been a lot of interest in um, surgeries that we can add to make the knee more stable. So this lateral extra articular tenodesis. Um, with that, we fasten a piece of the IT band on the outside of the knee um, that can decrease retail rates. Um, so especially in our high risk patients. So I think especially in the revision setting, adding this is a great option. Um, usually won't look towards this in a, a first time ACL reconstruction, but um, this is something else that we're you know actively studying and um, trying to make that um, ACL surgery even better. All right. Um, so we'll try to wrap up with these um, last two quickly. Um, case four, 18 year old left knee pain, football injury. Um, he was tackled from the outside, no pop, but immediate pain, no swelling, um, but just has, it keeps staying painful. Um, on exam, no effusion. He's tender all along the medial epicondyle and then pain with valgus stress, but no gapping. Um, and then our, maybe we'll just skip forward on the poll, but um, I'll give you this one as an MCL sprain. Um, so to evaluate an MCL injury, um, what we'll usually look for is medial sided knee pain. Um, and then most commonly it's going to be injured at the femoral origin of that ligament. Um, so tenderness along there, it can be along the mid substance. It can be down further on the tibia. Just a matters, uh, depends on where that injury is. Um, for an isolated MCL, usually we'll see focal swelling just in this medial area, uh, but no larger knee effusion. Um, and if there is that bigger knee effusion, then we're thinking, you know, is this an ACL plus MCL? Is this, um, you know, meniscus tear that's causing that effusion? Something else that's um, resulting in that. Uh, to test the MCL, we'll apply valgus stress and full extension and in 20, 30 degrees of knee flexion. Um, for grading, um, it's just graded on the degree of opening. Really importantly, grade one, though, can just be pain. Um, and then grade three, um, if you can apply valgus stress when they're in full extension and the knee opens, um, that's going to be really concerning. Um, 
Next slide. Um, and so for um, when we need to get advanced imaging, for most MCL sprains, um, you don't need to get an MRI. It won't really change our management. Um, however, if that patient has a joint effusion, any block to motion, um, or if they have that higher grade injury, you know, if it's a opening in extension or you feel like, um, you know, their Lachman is concerning um, potential for associated ligament injury, uh, would definitely look towards advanced imaging and referral. Um, and then this is just what these look like on MRI. This is a normal MCL. Um, so this is the medial side of the knee. And then this black band is the MCL. Um, you can see that it's you know uniform in its course. Um, and then here's a um, femoral sided MCL injury. So here's MCL here. And then right here is injured. And then this is um, still intact. Uh, for management, uh, treatment's dictated by how severe it is. For grade one injuries, um, anti-inflammatories, PT, um, no need for bracing. Um, you can use a knee sleeve, and then um, this can be a short return to sport. So for our highest level athletes, one to two weeks may take a bit longer for a recreational athlete, um, depending on how much they're dedicating to rehab. Uh, for a grade two injury, a little higher degree sprain, um, same initial management, but add a brace. Um, so if you feel like that MCL is opening at 30 degrees, um, they should be in a, a brace. And then this can still be treated non-surgically, return to sports in a month and a half. Um, and then grade three, um, I would make these patients non-weight bearing, get them in a brace, and then get them to an orthopedic surgeon. Um, some of these can still be treated successfully non-surgically, um, but um, definitely more concerning for associated injury and um, need for um, that potential intervention. All right, our last patient here. So 28-year-old woman, knee pain for four months, um, left side hurts more, both sides are painful. Uh, doesn't remember a an injury, but uh, was training for the marathon, had stopped running before. Um, full motion, stable knee, and no tenderness at the knee. Um, and on this one, our most likely diagnosis is uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, so patellofemoral pain syndrome will be the most common outpatient diagnosis for knee pain. Um, and it makes up a, a large proportion of injuries in runners, especially. Um, can be unilateral, can be bilateral, um, usually complaining of activity-related pain, and then worse with any stairs or inclines. Um, the onset will be atraumatic, um, maybe a change in activity level. So like I'm training for the marathon, I'm ramping up, and my knees start hurting with that increased activity. Um, it can just kind of come out of the blue. A weight can change can also provoke it. So um, you know, you can think of that as changing activity. Your knees are doing more due to that increase in weight. Uh, for symptoms, it's usually pain behind the patella, um, so pain at the front of the knee, uh, can just be more anterior medial also. Um, it's often this vague, deep, dull pain, hard to localize. And then um, patients may describe just pain with prolonged sitting. So long drive, sitting at their desk at work. Um, and then they should not have any swelling or any like, mechanical symptoms, any catching. Um, the exam for patellofemoral pain syndrome can be relatively benign. Um, their motion should be full, shouldn't have an effusion. You can have some crepitus. That's not an uncommon finding. And then um, the standing alignment, uh, most common outside of normal that we'll see is some valgus and foot pronation. And then uh, may have some quad atrophy. Um, I really like the single leg squat um, that I think isolates the quads, the hips, and um, gives you an idea of how they're managing their knee. Um, and often we'll see poor control with patients with patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, may have some tightness of the quad, the hamstrings, IT band. Um, and then treatment. So number one, I would try to identify that inciting event. Like, um, is this ramping up training too fast? Is it gaining weight? Is it adding too much? Um, and try to you know identify that undo it, and then gradually ramp back up. Um, bracing and taping is not really shown to be effective, uh, but physical therapy will be our mainstay. And so this is um, patellar mechanics control, quad strengthening, um, especially the VMO, stretching the lateral structures and hip abductor strengthening. And then oftentimes this will be in active people who are in good shape. So, you know, this patient, for instance, like training for a marathon, like she's not out of shape by any stretch, but it's really that mismatch in the lower extremity control. And so what I'll have patients do um, is also, how will PT help? Like I'm already running all the time. And then ask them in the office to do a single leg squat. And then they 
you don't have that control. And then um, I'll use that to just tell them like, this is what we're working on. And then as this improves, I anticipate your pain getting better. Um, there can be a lot of overlap with cartilage problems at the kneecap. So um, if they're not changing with a good PT program, um, or if they have perfect control, single leg squat, but ongoing symptoms, um, any swelling, uh, that's a real tip off. And then instability would say those are worth um, further evaluation, potentially further imaging as well. All right, so for takeaway points, um, I think remembering the anatomy when evaluating these knee complaints and injuries is key. Um, just going back to what structures are there and how those um, you know, can lead to problems. Uh, would encourage practice of the physical exam. So much is just based on that exam. So hopefully take advantage of those sessions tomorrow to hone those skills. And then um, keep in mind those, um, you know, uh, those specific situations where surgical option or more urgent referral uh, may benefit our patients. So thank you for um, joining. And um, I think, well, then believe we have the next talk and then um, questions after that, but happy to, you know, discuss more as we go. Thanks, Drew. That was great. Thanks. Anything? Yeah, we're actually going to take a few questions on your okay. talk, and then Dr. Luke will do the exam. Um, so okay. I have a few specific questions for you. A couple people have asked about your feelings on how often you can do cortisone injections for pain management. Um, and then a few other people have asked about how long a knee replacement will last and if that affects your management. Yeah, good. Great question. So for cortisone injections, I would recommend no more frequently in the same joint um, than every three to four months. Um, so generally trying for three, maybe four times in a year. Um, and um, if there is a surgical option aside from joint replacement, um, you know, if it is a meniscus tear that could be treated surgically, or if there's a cartilage thing that we could intervene on, um, then having repeated injections, you know, it may not be the right approach. So for a young patient, that might not be the right approach. Um, if you have more advanced arthritis and it's, you know, knee replacement, it's just a matter of when, but still getting good relief from that periodic injection, then like, yes, they may cause some damage at some level, but um, that trade-off for that symptomatic relief is probably worth it in the, that setting. Um, and then as to the knee replacement, um, I think, so I do everything in the knee except knee replacements, and we'll send those on to our joint replacement colleagues. But um, in general, I think we would expect um, like 90 plus percent to be in place at like 20, 25 years. Um, so um, I think that's a fair range to counsel patients. Um, it will be affected by, you know, their activity, but then, you know, the whole goal of doing it is to get them to stay active. Um, and, um, but you know, if you're 40 with more moderate arthritis, it's probably worth looking towards other solutions. If there are any, um, if you're 70, then, um, I think a lot less concern. Um, and then that decision-making, even for our younger patients, a lot of it comes down to quality of life. If, um, you know, even if somebody is 40, 45, but they're, um, debilitated by their knee and they've tried everything else and, um, there are times where that is the best option and then it can make, you know, a big difference in quality of life. Great. Thank you. Um, just quickly, uh, what knee braces do you like to prescribe and what, for what conditions? Yeah, good question. So, um, for like an MCL sprain, um, those higher grade, like the, like a grade two MCL, um, it, it, like there are MCL specific braces. Um, so there's like a, like the Bragg road runner as one example. Um, uh, but for that, you want like good side support, um, uh, cause basically that brace is substituting for that MCL and it's kind of offloading it while it heals. Um, and then, um, you know, they can be out of the brace. Um, and, um, and then there's a few good like patellar instability braces, um, but, uh, basically something that's giving like lateral support, um, and, um, and then the unloader braces, um, you know, I'll use like the medial lateral and loader braces based on the condition, um, like which, um, area of the joint is affected. Um, and then, you know, for like brands and specific names, I think there's a number of different companies that make high quality braces. Um, so Bragg, 
Don Joy, um, uh, you know, there's a few others, but um, I don't have a strong preference amongst those. Um, I think the biggest thing with, you know, something like an unloader brace is um, that needs to be through uh, like an orthotics um, shop. Um, like that's, there are some that you can get online, you can get at Walgreens, but like that one will not be the same if you're just getting it on your own. Um, needs to be measured, fitted appropriately, and would benefit from that more expert care. Great. Thank you. We have some more questions, but in the name of time, we're going to move on to the physical exam portion. And then if we have time, we'll um, talk to Dr. Luke about those. So thank you very much for your presentation. Sounds good. Thank you all.